Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. This is our shelter in place worship that we are providing. We are in our sixth week. So we are glad that you have brought us into your home. However, you're screening us if it's on a phone, an iPad, a computer, or your television. We are glad that we can be with you. As we prepare our hearts for worship, something that it's good to do, like I'm sitting right now, my feet are planted on the ground, I'm sitting up a little straighter, I'm not slouching, and then we can take some deep breaths, kind of close your eyes and, and just ready yourself to worship God. And one of the most difficult things in life is to be present, uh, especially right now, when we have so much worry that is on our hearts and, and in the world. We're going to join together in our call to worship. It's also known as a gathering prayer. It's a time where we are drawing our attention to God. It can be a centering prayer. So you may have heard some of this language before, but let us join together in our call to worship. Followers of Jesus, by his cross, we are redeemed from the futility of the brokenness of humanity. Hallelujah. By his rising, we are free from the fear of death. Hallelujah. By his love, we are made new in the living and enduring word of God. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. We're going to join together in our unison prayer of confession and wholeness. And in confession, what we are doing, we are lifting off the burden, the heaviness that, is, that we are experiencing, the things we've said or not said or done or not done. And it's in that lifting off and talking to God directly that we are creating, creating honesty and space for God to be at work in us for ways of peace and reconciliation. Let's join together in our unison prayer of confession and wholeness. Almighty God, our world is filled with corruption. Power disguises itself as truth. Convenience masquerades as goodness. Selfish pleasures imitates love. We confess to you, O God, that we have been caught in the web of the world's sin. By the power of the Holy Spirit, save us from these deceptions and free us from glad obedience, that we may see the joy of Jesus' resurrection and receive the promise of everlasting life. Amen. I invite you into a time of your own silent prayers and confessions. Amen. And when we seek God in prayer and in confession, we are always assured of God's grace and forgiveness. Followers of Jesus, God has promised salvation to us, to our children, and to all who are near and far. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen.
grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. And also with you. Please welcome John Bartley for our prayer of the day. The prayer of the day. O oh God, your son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please welcome Susan Nissim for our reading up from Acts. This reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 14a and 36 to 41. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3000 persons were added. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Please welcome Gina Johnson for our reading of the song. Good morning. Today's reading of from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death encompass me, and the tears of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, save my life. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. 
I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. O oh Lord, surely I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my hands. To thee I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. O oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Please welcome Marlon Morales for our reading of the Gospel. This is a Gospel reading from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, talking to each other about everything that had happened these past three days. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing them. Him, and he said to him, what are you discussing to each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these past three days? He asked them what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of, of, of Nazareth, the prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it is now the third day since this thing took place. Moreover, some women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they, they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of them who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart you are to believe that all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things to enter into the glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village, to which they were going, he walked ahead of them. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is nearly over. So he went and he stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were our hearts not burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and opening up the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Israel, Jerusalem, and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and now he had been made known to them in breaking of the bread. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Thanks be to God. Hi, boys and girls. See where we are? This is Good Shepherd's Garden. All around us, we have flowers blooming. We have food that's growing. There's strawberries. There's a whole bunch of beans. There's wonderful things that are growing in our garden. It's springtime, and today is Earth Day. So this week, we are celebrating Earth, Earth Week. And this is a time where we are saying, hey, Mother Earth, this is precious. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we grow, it's important and we need to take care of it. I'm reminded of a passage last week I talked about Genesis and God saying, you need to rest, you need to take a Sabbath. 
Well, before he, he rested, he was doing all this creation and he was creating the earth. The earth that we love, we live on, everyone we know, our life is here on this earth. And God wants us to take care of the earth, the water, the air, the animals, plants, everything in this earth, on this earth, under the earth, God wants us to take care of them. See what I'm holding? This is a stole. So the one I wore on Easter is white. This is one, it's green, see? This is the one I wear most of the year. So there's stuff where it's Advent, I wear a color, and there's Christmas, I wear a color, there's Lent, there's Easter, but most of the year, I wear this. And you wanna know why I wear it? Green is about renewal. It's about being refreshed. It's about being restored. And we go through most of our life needing to be restored and refreshed. So the sermons I give, the readings that we have, are all about being restored and renewed in God. And that's what the green represents. And with this Earth Week, God is reminding us once again that we have to care for our planet so that we can be renewed and restored and that we can leave it in good health for our next generation. The generations before us gave us a beautiful planet. And it's our job to keep that planet, to make it even more beautiful, so that we can give it to the generations who come after us. Would you like to say a prayer with me? God, in this glorious planet, we give you thanks for the earth, for the stars, for the animals, who live in all the different wildlifes, in deserts, in mountains, in jungles, in prairies. All of these places, these animals call home. The water we drink, help us keep it clean. Keep habitat safe from destruction. We lift up all these prayers and how we can be best stewards to this planet you gave us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, please pray with me. Loving God, may the meditation of all of our hearts, the word read and proclaimed, our song sung, our prayers prayed, our communion, Restore us, renew us, and make us new in you. You've just heard the gospel reading from Marlon, and it reminded me of a story about a pastor who asked a group of vacation Bible school children. He asked them, what does forgiveness feel like? And the class of little six-year-olds, they all stared up at him blankly for a little while, and then suddenly, an expression came over a little boy. It was clear that he had an idea and he was excited to share it. And he smiled, his hand shot right up. And he said, I know what forgiveness feels like, said the child. It feels like it's your birthday and you get to start all over again new. And each of our scripture passages that were read have these themes in them, from the reading in Acts, from the Psalm, to the Gospel of Luke. Each has a theme of starting new, about transcendence, and forgiveness. And the road to Emmaus story, it is one of the most enticing stories in the Gospel. The Emmaus story serves as a transition between this puzzling reaction to the empty tomb and the ultimate appearance to the disciples with Jesus. Now the account has two disciples walking seven miles back from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Seven miles is a long, long walk home, knowing that they are feeling hopeless, they're feeling helpless. After hearing the news of Christ, crucified, seven long miles. They must have been walking back home in just stunned disbelief, as if they bet on the wrong savior, just shaking their heads. What has happened? What's become of all of this? 
And at some level, most of us can identify with the disciples being stunned into disbelief, silence, confusion, disappointment that sinks into grief. For all of us, as we experience that sinking into grief and disappointment, we experience that each day as we're all sheltered in place, as the shock and the dismay that each passing day we learn of new realities and loss of life from the COVID-19 virus. The road back to ever being normal is going to take a long, long time. But some of us know that stunned silence in, in many other ways. Some of us know the stunned silence if, we, if you've ever waited in a hospital waiting room when the doctor comes and has to tell you the news and it leaves you speechless and silent. And out of this tear-choked silence, you muster the courage to ask, how much time do we have left? Others may know the silence from being in a loveless marriage, while others know the dread of learning that they no longer have a job. The list goes on and on and on, but we understand that long seven-mile walk home. And like the disciples, we know what that feels like. With each passing step, the disciples, their words, their hearts are heavier. Their hearts are heavier than the very supplies they would have carried on their backs, coming home from the Passover celebration, coming back from the holy city. The holy city that has become a city of whores and bloodshed. Then out of the burdens that they carry, their heads stooped, walking along in that heavy, grief-filled way. The shadows lengthen, evening starts to draw near, and the busy world begins to hush. And then another character comes into view and comes alongside the two and falls right into step with them. And he asks, what were they discussing as he walked up? Luke's Gospel has set this strange stage for Jesus, his own interpretation of his sufferings. The suffering and the death of Jesus were to be understood not as an ultimate defeat of God's purpose, but as the necessary pathway to a new life and God's purpose. David Brooks, his book, called The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. He writes about his own upbringing in New York City, that he is raised Jewish, while at the same time being raised and living in a Christian church and a world. He talks about this formative period in life that many Jews were experiencing at the time. They were being raised and taught in both religions and embracing what he calls an, Anglo, an, Anglo, an Anglophilia. And that was embracing these genteel, these elegant, these stiff upper lip kind of qualities of the English aristocracy that seemed the furthest distance from the immigrant Jews trying to make their way into this new world. And they had a slogan, and it was called, Think Yiddish and Act British. And his childhood is spent in the Episcopal Church, and he learned hymns, the Lord's prayers, and liturgies, and the story of Jesus. Then he goes on to share that Jesus is this classic scapegoat, the innocent, the outsider, that all the groups could rally around with their bloodlust, and he, they could dump all of their hatred onto Jesus. But the only thing that's different about Jesus, and it's a big difference, is that Jesus came to earth precisely to be the scapegoat. He volunteered for the job, forgave those who executed him, willingly carried the sins of the world on his shoulders. He came precisely to bow down, to suffer, and to redeem the world. He came not to be the awesome conquering Messiah that many of us would have wanted, but he came to be the lamb, to submit, to love enemies. He came 
not to be the victim of sin, but he came to be the solution of sin. His strength was self-sacrificial. His weapon was love so that we might live. And he goes on to say, that is one heck of a clever plot twist. And this clever plot twist, that's exactly what the disciples are walking home to Emmaus, feeling heartbreak. He's been the scapegoat. He was not the conqueror. They're in absolute dismay. And then suddenly, Christ comes alongside them, walks with them, step for step, stride for stride. And the scripture says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They invite him to stay for the evening. And Christ sits with them while they break the bread. And the scripture says that when Christ took the bread and sat at table with them, he took the bread, blessed, broke, and gave it to them. He took, blessed, broke, and gave. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from sight. The story is timely for us to listen to today because it moves from isolation that many of us know all too well to community. Christ joins himself to those on the way. Christ makes room for those who show a graceful hospitality. God always creates space for the other, for the stranger, in the hope that a faith community will be created. The disciples turn to one another and say, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening up the scriptures to us? If scripture, it's best understood in community. We really do need to be in a community. We need others to challenge we might have narrow ideas and narrow understandings. We need to be in a community to hear of other pe people's experiences and their witness. And it's in this shared community world of faith that we are opened up, we are enriched, our lives deepen, our faith matures, and community is essential. We can't just be spiritual islands unto ourselves. For the spiritual, spiritual people we might, they might experience a transcendence. But we understand that for most people, spiritual, spirituality, it lasts and it deepens only if it's lived out in a rich and sometimes maddening community of institutional religion, organized religion. That's how we come to make sense and to be in community. Religion embedded the love of God in holidays, in stories, practices, rituals. It makes them solid. It makes them enduring. Spirituality, it's, a, it's an emotion. Religion is an obligation. Spirit, spirit, spirituality, it soothes. Religion, it mobilizes. Spirituality is satisfied with itself, and religion is dissatisfied with the world. And this is what is happening to the disciples in their shared communal encounter with Christ. They are mobilized, and they are forever changed. They were not soothed. They were not satisfied. They were not complacent. What they experienced was the good news to be shared. News that creates and transforms people. It transforms community. All of us that experience the grace of Christ, we must offer witness to others that they too might come to know Christ in the breaking of the bread. So as all of us, we journey through the Easter season, we can be assured, just as that six-year-old boy in VBS who knew exactly what forgiveness feels like. And we can be assured of broken bread 
how it nurses our broken faith. And it can nourish the courage we need to leave the grave clothes behind, the ones that we carry. We can leave those behind and walk away from the tomb of our own defeated dreams. And the weary travelers, they're renewed. The women at the tomb, they're filled with joy. And the breaking of the bread, the beams of the dawn of resurrection shine brightly on that long seven mile walk home from Jerusalem. And their sacred journey from the holy city has just begun. And this is our story, each of us. This is the journey that we take as we walk together as a community of faith and we witness and share with others. It's in that place that we too are like the disciples, that sometimes our eyes we don't recognize, but then in the breaking of the bread, Christ is made known to us. It's in that making known that we are forever changed and God calls us to continue to go out into the world. That's the power of the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. My friends, may it be so for each of you and also very much for me. Amen. Let's join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's join together in our prayers of intercession. Please pray with me. We are uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection. We join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Let's take a moment of our, for our own silent prayer. Amen. We pray for those whose hearts are fervent with love for your gospel, that they are empowered to tell the story of your love in their lives and to show hospitality in response to this love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the diverse natural world, for jungles and prairies and forests, valleys, mountains, for all the wild and endangered animals who call these spaces home, that they are nurtured and protected. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For broken systems we have inherited and that we continue to perpetuate, forgive us. Restrain the nations from fighting over limited resources. Redeem us from the cycles of scarcity and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who, are, who call upon your healing name, give rest, stay with us, walk with those who are hungry, friendless, despairing, and desiring healing in body and in spirit, especially those that we name now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the faith forming ministries of this church, for those preparing for baptism, communion, confirmation, membership, for those who participate in the Sunday School for Children and Adults, guide and inspire learners of every age and ability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Give us thankful hearts for those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, let's turn to one another and pass the peace of Christ and say God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it.
This is the time for our communion. For those of you, you're all at home. If you'd like to get some wine or some grape juice, you can get bread, a cracker, a bagel, whatever you'd like. You can come and sit down, gather around, however you are screening us today. Friends, this is the most generous invitation that we can make in our tradition. And people will come from the east and the west, the north and the south, to sit at the table of the kingdom of God. And all are welcome to this table. It doesn't matter how much money you make, who you love, where you were born. You are welcome to this table. If you've been baptized in faith, if you're seeking to know Christ, you can come to this table. If this is not your tradition, we ask that you remain with us in solidarity, knowing that we are united in our diversity and not our conformity. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. With thanksgiving and unending joy, we echo on earth the song of the angels in heaven as they praise your glory forever. bread and blessed it and broke it and their eyes were open and they recognized him. And when he took the bread and blessed it and broke it, he said, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he poured the cup. He said, this is the new covenant. It's sealed in my blood. It's shed for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you eat from this loaf and you drink from this cup, you will proclaim the living Lord. My friends, these are the gifts of God, and all of you are the people of God. Amen. Please pray with me. Loving God, we lift up prayers of thanksgiving for this meal. And in this communion meal, you are present with us in some mystery. You are here with us, and it's in your presence that we are restored, we are renewed. It's in this meal that we shine the light of you, and we take that light out into the world. Lord, we also, we thank you, living God, for your Son who sustains us in the wilderness, in the garden alike. As Christ loved us, 
so send us to love Christ and our neighbors. Let's pray in solidarity for our brothers and sisters here and around the world who are sick from the coronavirus. Let's pray for those who have lost loved ones to this virus. May God console them and grant them peace. We pray also for doctors and nurses and caregivers, for public health officials and all civic leaders. May God grant them courage and prudence as they seek to respond to this emergency with compassion and in service to the common good. Amen. Friends, as we go out into today, into this week and into this life, let us go with God's grace and know that we have but little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. Oh, be swift to love, make haste to be kind. Let's all go in peace. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You are the body of Christ, raised up for the world. Share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.